Looking back over the now 30, 35 years of student missions, what I've seen is what started as sort of an experimental thing. Maybe this will be good for kids. Maybe we can give them an experience of a different part of the world. Maybe it can challenge them to grow some. It's grown from that to a, to a major plank in our student ministries platform. My faith journey started when my family started coming to Chapel Street when I was a seventh grader. Uh, and I was not super involved for a while. Like I was kind of on the, on the margins, I was into some small groups, went to some things and pursuing Jesus wasn't really a priority for me. But yet I still, like I kept finding myself involved. And then I remember I was, I just finished my sophomore year and there was an opportunity to go to Ecuador on a mission trip. I had never been out of the country. I'd never actually even been on an airplane. Again, like my faith certainly wasn't my own. I was just kind of a kid that was on the fringe of a church youth group. And so really for me in Ecuador is when my faith came alive. As my wife and I, uh, years ago, uh, worked uh, in, at Wheaton College. Uh, my wife helped uh, as an instructor in a class of Wheaton College students. And so we, for a couple of years, we taught a semester of this class. And we came to believe that at the college level, we could tell upon first meeting a class of college students how many of them had had experiences in high school where they'd been overseas. We could just tell by their worldview, by how, by their maturity, and we, that really influenced me that, that this is really important because you can see it in their lives if they've had this experience. I was one of those kids on those trips whose, whose life and faith was really altered by those serving experiences. And uh, so now like having the opportunity to lead those things, I just, I feel like I see it from a slightly different perspective than most. It's just so unique for me to be able to watch students over the course of a trip like have kind of light bulb moments. Our student missions program that's developed over these years has had tremendous impact. You know, our four sons all grew up here at Chapel Street. They grew up in our church and they all had multiple student mission experiences in our youth ministries. All of them would say of all the things that they grew up with in church, among the very most important in their faith stories are student, student missions. They're watching what happened in my boys as they had these experiences was dramatic in our family, and I'm grateful for those things. I think this generation of students is just growing up in such a loud, like, distracted world. I think they feel so much pressure to get it all right. I want them to understand that Jesus wants to be in relationship with them. He's paid the price and they have an opportunity to connect with him and learn from him and walk with him and grow with him. And, um, so it's way less about all the rules and all the things I have to do and I have to get it all right and way more of a relationship and to then share that with other people and serve other people. I think when it comes to like short-term mission trips, while, while it is a group of students and leaders going, I really view it as a thing that our entire church gets to play a part in. And so I think one of the greatest opportunities for our church to be involved in what student missions, what's happening in student missions, is to come to the student missions auction. It's an opportunity to get to know some students, to hear some stories, to directly partner and pray with a student who's going on that trip, and really an opportunity to kind of get a look into what is God doing in our students and through student missions and to participate in it. Looking back, I'm here, not there. Well, I am uh, so glad and proud to be part of a church family that invests in the next generation. As you saw, it's been important in uh, our own family with our uh, sons as they grew up here at Chapel Street. And it's important to a lot of them. And we support them enthusiastically as a church family. This summer, our next gen team under uh, the leadership of Pastor Tom Ward will be taking some just over 175 students and leaders on short-term projects at all different levels from middle school on up through high school. And I'd like to encourage uh, us as a church family to support them enthusiastically. The Student Missions Auction is uh, Sunday, April 28th, so the last Sunday in April, It'll be an evening event. It's lots of fun. Lots of things are up for auction and bid, and it's, it's really a great way to support our students. I hope you'll come out for that. And before I begin, I want to um, give a greeting to our Kessinger Church family this morning. This morning, tomorrow, it's Saturday night here. A little confusing, but I want to thank our uh, tech team, Brett Davis and Eric Robertson, for making this possible for me to be with you by video today. Well, would it surprise any of you if I said <clears throat> that 
the vast majority of people living in our culture believe in Jesus, at least to some degree. A recent study by the Barner Group showed that over 90% of American adults believe Jesus was a real person who lived in history. But that's where the agreement ends. The same survey showed that only about 50% of people in America believe that Jesus was eternal or that he's divine. And the other 50% believe he was just a spiritual teacher, an influential spiritual teacher, like Muhammad or Buddha, but not God. John Lennon of the Beatles once said, I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. Which, of course, is nonsense, because they all taught very different things. Some think of Jesus as the supreme example of compassion and tolerance because he loved everyone, even his enemies. And that's true. Some think of him as the kind of social revolutionary who cared for the poor and the marginalized. That's also true. And we are here today uh, because we believe not only that Jesus really lived in history, not only was he loving and compassionate and kind, but that he, that he was indeed, in fact, God in the flesh, and that he died and rose again for our salvation. That is the heart of the gospel. But even in this room, people here for that reason, my guess is there's lots of different images of Jesus sort of floating around in our minds. What was Jesus like? What did he look like, for example? How many are familiar with this version? This is the famous portrait painted in 1940 by Warner Solomon. This was actually hanging on a wall in the home I grew up in. Uh, I call it Swedish Jesus. Uh, and the church I grew up in um, had a lot of Norwegian immigrants in it, many of whom were builders. So I kind of thought of Jesus as a Norwegian carpenter. This is the picture. Or how about this one? I called this one rock star Jesus. <laughs> or maybe you think of Jesus like this. Ancient Jesus, distant and sort of otherworldly. Or how do you feel about this one? This was generated by AI, what an average Jewish man of his time might have looked like. I personally like this one because I do believe Jesus had a wonderful sense of humor and I think he was joyful. And then of course there's the real Jesus. You may recognize him as the actor Jonathan Rumi, who is the Jesus character in the Chosen series. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus looked like, but it does tell us who he was and who he is and that we can know him. So we're in part five today of our series called Unrecognized King, a seven-part series will take us all the way through Easter weekend. And so far, we've looked at four stories from John's gospel in which Jesus tells us something about who he is what his purpose is, what his, who, what his authority is, and in each story, someone or a group of people disagree and fail to recognize him. In John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. In John 9, he said, I am the light of the world. In John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. In John 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And today we are backing up a bit to chapter two of John's gospel and the story of the cleansing of the temple. Now, the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, put this story right toward the end of their gospel accounts, within two weeks of the crucifixion. But John puts it early in his gospel, chapter two. And most scholars believe that's because John is telling the story of Jesus as much thematically as he is chronologically but that's a long discussion we don't have time for here today. So let's just look at the story. We're going to be in John chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 13. You can watch on the screens, open your Bibles, and I'll talk us through this whole story, and then we'll dig into it. John chapter 2, verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I'm going to pause there. I want you to notice that little word, up. doesn't seem very important, but... Jesus has just been, uh, for the recent few days, north of Jerusalem in the region of Jericho. And Jericho is one of the lowest places on the face of the earth. It's 700 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is 2,400 feet above sea level. So to walk there, Jesus literally has to walk uphill all the way. Just one little example of the historical and geographical accuracy and the detail of the New Testament. That little word, up. Verse 14, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, 
and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, notice that animal type, the bird dove. We'll come back to that in a little bit. He said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Three things. First, the corruption of the temple, and then the cleansing of the temple, and then the completion of the temple. I want to begin with the corruption of the temple. Imagine uh, you're on your way to church today in your car. And as you enter the parking lot, you notice a brand new sign you've not seen before, and it says, church parking, $10. And then you see another sign just beyond that, where there's usually handicapped spaces, and this one says, premium parking, $15. My guess is most of you would just keep on driving without even slowing down, and maybe go find another church. But let's say you cough up the 10 or 15 bucks, and you park. Then you get to the door and you're met by a greeter who notices your children with you and says, just worship today or worship in Sunday school? You say, excuse me? They say, well, worship only is $5, but add Sunday school to that and it's $10. And so you go, you reach in your wallet and then they say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we can't take U.S. currency here because you don't know where it's been after all. So you have to go over there to the desk and purchase your Chapel Street bucks that have been pre-approved. So when you go to the desk there, you find out you get one chapel street buck for $1.50 U.S. currency. You get to the worship center and an usher offers you a Bible because it's a special chapel street translation of the Bible and the one you brought doesn't really measure up. So you can rent one of these for five chapel street bucks for one service or you can buy one for 50 chapel street bucks. Now that sounds ridiculous, even outrageous to us. May sound even kind of funny. But that's kind of like what's going on in this story. Verse 13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Let me try to explain what's going on. It's time for the Passover, which is one of the great feasts of the Jewish faith. People from all over Israel flocking to Jerusalem in order to observe the feast, pay their temple tax, more than that in a moment, and offer sacrifices to God as an act of worship. The Temple Mount uh, dominated ancient Jerusalem, about 36 acres in all, the size of 25 football fields. It was the focal point of the city, and it still is today. And this is what it looks like today. The temple uh, of Jesus' day no longer exists. Uh, The mount is dominated by what's called the Dome of the Rock. You see that gold dome in almost every picture is Jerusalem, and that's actually an Islamic shrine that's part of the Al-Asqa Mosque. Here's what the the Temple Mount looked like in Jesus' day. It was one of the most magnificent sites in the entire ancient world, known as King Herod's Temple, which is actually a renovation of the second temple that was built some 500 years earlier, and the renovation work of King Herod took over 40 years. You can see the temple proper to the right of the image, which included the altar for sacrifices, the court of the priests, and what was called the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was believed to dwell. Then you see the court of Jewish men outside that, and then outside that wall you see the court of Jewish women, and then to the left at a distance from the temple and the Holy of Holies was the court of the Gentiles, which was as close to God as the non-Jewish people could get It was an outer court, a large space, some 14 acres or so covered that space. So the the property right here at Mill Creek is about eight acres. At Kesslinger, it's 22 acres, so somewhere in between. That's a large area all on the Temple Mount. It was in this area, the Gentile court, that scholars believe all this selling was taking place, where the animal vendors were, the money changers set up shop. Picture something like a large flea market outdoors joined to a petting zoo. That's what it would have looked like. The temple tax was a half shekel 
to be paid by every Jewish meal once a year at the time of the Passover. But there was a catch. The tax could not be paid in Roman or Greek currency because that was regarded as unclean. And so it was necessary to exchange Roman currency, like a denarius, for proper temple money called shekels. So this became the opportunity for the money changers to charge an exorbitant rate of exchange. Of exchange. So they would bring their Roman money and they have to pay extra just to get the, uh, the Jewish money. So sometimes the upcharge was over 50%. Passover was also a time when worshipers were required to offer a sacrifice to God as an act of worship, a sacrificial animal. Upper class families uh, would bring a sheep or a goat. Lower class families would bring a dove or a pigeon. Uh, they could bring their own animals from home, from however far they walked. Uh, sometimes it would be more convenient to just buy one at the temple. Uh, but if they brought them from home, they had to make sure they were inspected by a priest first to make sure they were clean and appropriate for sacrifice. The priest would most often then find something wrong with the animal brought from home and say, you need to go over there and buy one that's been pre-approved for sacrifices at the temple. Again, at marked up prices. So you get the picture. The worship of God has become a commodity to be bought and sold. Worship is being corrupted by greed. Imagine a Chapel Street pastor, me, Joe, Sterling, somebody, um, ending a sermon by offering forgiveness certificates. And they're available in denominations of $100 up to $1,000, depending on how much forgiveness you particularly need. <laughs> now that's not far from what was happening in the 1500s when the Roman church was selling what were called indulgences, literally selling remission of sins for you or a loved one in purgatory, selling forgiveness, and that led to the Protestant Reformation. Years ago, not, long, not that long ago, but a few years ago, I had a conversation with a, a lady on an airplane traveling somewhere. Uh, she found out I was a pastor, and she started telling me some of her story, and she told me that, with tears, that the church she was connected to, which was a, a different denomination, had denied her father a funeral because he was behind in his offerings. Jesus sees all this. He's likely watched it every year of his life for 30, 31, 32 years, and on this day, he's seen enough. We read in the prophet Jeremiah, has this house which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Temple worship has become corrupt. And that leads us to the second point, the cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the temple. Uh, growing up in my home, I, I hardly ever saw my father get angry, you know, really angry. He was, he was under control, he was a joyful guy. He would get angry, but he never really angry, except two or three times in my whole life. And one of those times was when I was about 14 years old, my younger brother Joe about 11, and we had a little brother at the time who was like two, two and a half years old. Well, at the time, my brother Joe and I got into a kind of a model building phase of boyhood. Anybody here do that, where you're building like model cars, model planes, model boats, whatever? We went through a summer, and all we did all summer was build model airplanes, military airplanes usually. Uh, maybe, I think I built like 13 in one summer. And we lined them all up and stuff. But somewhere along the line, uh, we had gotten a hold of some firecrackers. I think we were taking a spring break trip, stopped in South Carolina, and my dad got us some and gave us a whole bunch of rules about how to use them, not use them, whatever. And they sat in the closet forever, but we had some firecrackers. And it was kind of inevitable that our model airplanes and the firecrackers were destined to meet <laughs> at some time. So we set up a card table in my bedroom, got several of our older model airplanes, ones we thought were kind of expendable, took out a couple of packs of firecrackers, found one of my mom's dinner candles. Anybody sensing danger yet? <laughs> like what could possibly go wrong? Our plan was to use the hot wax from the candles, drip it onto the model airplanes, glue the firecrackers onto there all over the airplanes, take them out to the front yard, light them all, run away, and watch them just blow to bits. It was awesome. <laughs> Until, that is, our little brother, John, who was about two and a half at the time, came into the room to see what we were doing. He toddles in. We were so engrossed in our pyromania. You know, I was saying every 
male, there's a little pyromaniac trying to get out. Uh, we didn't even notice that he picked up a firecracker and held it in the candle. Yep. I hear the sound of a fuse burning. I turn around just in time to grab the firecracker out of my little brother's hand before it, boom, it explodes just in, in my hand. But he starts crying because he's scared. He's wailing now. An explosion followed by wailing, followed by my father running up the stairs into our room. He takes one look at the setup and he goes, what are you guys doing? How can you be so stupid? And I never heard him use language like that. He later came back and apologized for using the word stupid because we weren't supposed to use it, but he used it then. He was angry, good and angry, and he was right. Because what we were doing was foolish and it was dangerous. Verse 15, so he made a whip out of cords. Now the word for whip here is in Greek, phragelion. It's not what we think of when we think of whip. We think of a bull whip, like Indiana Jones bull whip, right? But it wasn't really that. It was probably a handful of small cords or ropes left over from you know, the animals and, the, and, and things like that. He just picked up and spontaneously turned it into a whip. And I found this in my garage, a little rope, frayed it a little bit. It'd be something like this that he used to drive away animals, not really to hurt people. So something like this he was using most likely. And drove all the people all, drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, and scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to those who sold doves. I told you to notice that. The word means either dove, doves or pigeons. And way back in Leviticus chapter 5, we, uh, we, are, we learned that the sacrifice allowed for the poor were doves and pigeons. And Luke tells us in Luke 2 that after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple to dedicate him, and they brought sacrifices of two turtle doves, which means maybe Jesus knew that it was people like his mother and earthly father who were being ripped off when they tried to worship God. He said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And this isn't the Jesus we often imagine. This isn't meek and mild, turn the other cheek Jesus, is it? This is turn over the tables, whip cracking Jesus. This image comes from a 17th century painting by an Italian artist You see the whip in his hand, the chaos it's, it's creating. Now stop for a moment and think about this for just a second. I told you the temple is, was a large area, 36 uh, acres, big area. And the court of the Gentiles was like 14 acres of that. And I've told you there, there are probably thousands of people gathered, bustling around trying to buy sacrifices, trying to get them to the place of sacrifice, trying to exchange their money, trying to pay their tax. Jesus, and there are dozens of temple guards, armed temple guards, take, making sure everything stays safe. And here's one man with a homemade whip, and he shuts down the whole operation by himself? Think about that. How? Don't really know, but I think this might be another sign, almost a miracle, because I think the authority and holiness of God himself somehow may have emanated through Jesus with a kind of power and presence that was terrifying. And people got out of there because there's a crazy man on the loose. The disciples watching immediately remembered Psalm 69 where David says, I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own, to my own mother's children for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. The word zeal comes from the Greek word zealos, from which we get our word zealous, it means passion. We would call it fire in the belly. And most of Jesus' ministry, which we read in the Gospels, was marked by compassion and kindness and mercy. But here we see a kind of divine fury. Why? What's got Jesus so fired up? This is about two things, I think. First, hypocrisy, and second, holiness. The hypocrisy is, those of those is of those who claim to be representing God, who instead are cheating people in the name of God. It occurs to me, the TV preacher who's praying on the vulnerable, saying, just send me that 100 bucks and God will give you a blessing. Jesus is also concerned about holiness here. 
The temple represented both the presence and the very holiness of God, Yahweh, the creator of all things. And the holiness of God, if we understand it, is a fearsome thing. In Leviticus 10, we're told that the two sons of Aaron the high priest, two guys named Nadab and Abihu, disobeyed the command of God by offering what the Bible calls unauthorized fire before the Lord. In other words, they disregarded the instructions and command of the Lord. They disregarded the holiness and authority of the Lord and approached God frivolously in a disrespectful manner. We read, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. This is what the writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament talks about in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably and with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The holiness of God is being corrupted by greed, by sin. And Jesus, in his righteous zeal and authority, picks up some cords and drives out that which is unholy. But not just to drive it out, but to allow access to all those people, all those Gentiles, trying at least to get close to the God of Israel. He's allowing access to the presence and grace and forgiveness of God. And here we come to the great paradox of Jesus. In holiness, Jesus cannot tolerate corruption and sin because he's holy. But in his great love and mercy, he is also the grace of God poured out for the unholy, for sinners. So I want you to see this. Jesus here is removing barriers removing unholy barriers that are keeping people from the very presence of God. And more than that, he's pointing to himself as the true temple of God. That leads to the third part today, the completion of the temple. Verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Now, right about now, it should be occurring to you that Jesus has already fed 5,000 men, more with women and children, with five loaves and two fish and said, I am the bread of life. There's a sign. He's already healed a man born blind and said, I am the light of the world. There's another sign. He most recently raised a dead man, Lazarus, back to life by calling his name, said, I am the resurrection and the life. Sign three, and still they ask, what sign can you give us to show us you have authority? Now we know that each, after each of these previous signs, many did believe and responded that he's the Messiah. But many still did not recognize who Jesus is. So Jesus makes one more outrageous claim. Verse 19, Jesus answers them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. So the temple in Jerusalem was the literal and symbolic presence of God with his people. The temple was where the holiness of God was believed to dwell in the holy of holies separated by the curtain that eventually tore at the moment of Jesus' death. We'll get to that in a few weeks. The temple was the place of sacrifice where the blood of sacrificial lambs and goats and doves was spilled to cover the sins of the people. When Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days, he's not talking about a building. He's not talking about bricks and mortar. He's not talking about the rituals of religion. He's talking about death and resurrection. He's saying, I am the true temple of God. I am the holiness and presence of God. Remember what John said at the beginning of his gospel? John chapter 1, verse 14. We always read this at Christmas time. The word became flesh 
and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, glory is of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is saying, that's me. I am the lamb that will be sacrificed for the sins of the people. All that the temple has represented to you, now fulfilled in me, in my body. Therefore, access to God's holiness, access to God's presence, access to God's forgiveness, access to God's salvation is through me, through my body. And you don't have to pay a tax. You don't have to bring a bunch of money. You don't have to bring an animal to kill. He speaks through the prophet Isaiah when he says, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the water. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Remember the purpose of John's gospel? That you may believe Jesus is the Messiah and that believing you may have life in his name. John wraps up the story in verse 22. After he was raised from the dead, His disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Even the disciples struggled to understand. And you you can kind of get that. Who could comprehend what he was saying? Destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. But after he was raised, they believed. Jesus is the true and completed temple. But the New Testament also says something interesting. It says, we are also his temple. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That means you and me, individually, by faith, we are temples where the Holy Spirit dwells. And also, we collectively, all together, as the community called the church, we also are his temple. Peter says it this way, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we together are a spiritual house, a temple in which the presence and holiness of God is to dwell. So, Picture Jesus, the same Jesus we're reading about, with all the authority and holiness of God, filled with zeal for his house because it belongs to him. And he's walking through the temple first of your life, of my life. Just walking through. Ask yourself, would he find any tables to turn over? If you walk through this this church, Chapel Street, Would he find any tables to turn over? Would he find any selfish or greedy or lustful or corrupt merchant set up shop in the hallways, courtyards of our hearts? Is there any way in which we as a church are more interested in religious appearances than in holiness? I think this story tells us that Jesus walks among his temple because it belongs to him. And that he stands at the doorway, stands at the gate, eyes and heart blazing with holy fire, and he wants to make the holy place clean again. And he wants to drive out that which doesn't belong. Only this time, he doesn't barge in with whip in hand. He just waits for an invitation. He waits for our invitation. Let me bow with me as I close. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful and powerful picture of both your holiness and your love. So we invite you. We invite you by your spirit to walk through our own hearts, our lives, the rooms and hallways and closets where sin or selfishness may lurk. And we give you permission to drive it out by your holy grace. And Lord, we invite you to walk through this, your church. Remove anything that grieves your heart, anything that limits access 
to your presence and your salvation. Drive it out. And we give you our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.